podcast. Rock City. What's up, everybody? Joe here from Podcast Rock City. I want to thank you guys for listening to the last show. I didn't put a show out this past week, but I was trying to catch up on all the work I missed from going to WrestleMania. It's an amazing how you take a vacation, you just come back to more work. It's really aggravating. Anyway, <laughs> you don't care. Anyway, uh, so listen, I want to I want to say something before I get started. For those of you who are on iTunes. Please go on the Podcast Rock City uh, site or page or whatever it is and leave a review for me. Um, it's really important. You leave reviews, that bumps my show up. More people get to see it. It makes the show more popular, although it is already more popular than I could have ever hoped for. And, I, you know, I want to thank all the guys from the podcast group, you know, Matt Porter, everybody, all, all the guys, Cassius you know, Jody, uh, Ken, you know, they're all great guys and they've all taken me right under their wing and helped me out and done shows with me and, and helped me, you know, learn how to do a podcast, although I'm still learning and I will always be learning, but go on the, um, go on the iTunes page and leave me a review. It would be much appreciated. <clears throat> I love the letters that I get on podcast rock city one, the number one at gmail.com. Always give me your opinion. If you think I'm wrong on something, tell me if you think I'm spot on, tell me YouTube. I still get tons of hits on that and you guys leave great little messages. Keep it up. It's a lot of fun and I love, you know, the banter back and forth. I wanted to do a two-part show, although it's two parts, but it's all in one. I want to talk about the Hall of Fame, and then I want to talk about Paul Stanley's book after that. So let's start with the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame started with Tom Morello giving his introduction speech, and if you haven't heard that, I'm going to play it right now. Good evening. I'm Tom Morello. They are four of the most recognizable faces on the planet and one of the most iconic and badass bands of all time. Tonight is the night that Kiss enters the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Out time! Growing up, Kiss was my favorite band, and it was not always easy being a Kiss fan. Just as Kiss were relentlessly persecuted by critics, their fans were relentlessly persecuted by the self-appointed arbiters of taste in middle schools and high schools across America. Arguments and even fist fights were not uncommon. I recall as a 15-year-old telling one bully, you can kiss my kiss-loving ass, because Kiss was never a critic's band, Kiss was a people's band. And so, I waited in a long line on a bitter cold Chicago morning to buy a ticket for my first concert, a KISS concert. I was especially thrilled because imprinted on the ticket were words that hinted that it was going to be a special event. The ticket said, a partial view of KISS. I was certain this meant the band were going to reveal some new secret corner of their artistic souls. In reality, it meant that my seat was behind a pole. Still, that concert was the most exciting, cathartic, loudest, and most thrilling two hours of live music I've seen to this day. And while there is often debate about who should and shouldn't be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I think the criteria are actually quite simple. Impact, influence, and awesomeness. And KISS have all three in spades. Impact. KISS have sold over 100 million albums worldwide. They have 28 gold, 28 gold albums in the United States alone. That's more than any other American rock band in history. Their theatrics, their theatrics were indisputably groundbreaking, but it was KISS's music that had an impact on me. All four guys wrote great songs. All four guys were great lead singers. They practically, that's correct. They practically invented the live album with Kiss Alive. 
Then came Destroyer, Rock and Roll Over, Love Gun, Alive 2, Dynasty, all exploding with killer riffs and themic choruses and screaming solos that for 40 years have been filling arenas and stadiums around the world. Influence, simply put, Kiss is the band that made me and millions of others love rock and roll. What Elvis and the... And apparently a few people in the room tonight. What, what Elvis and the Beatles were to previous generations, Kiss were to us. They propelled millions of young people to pick up instruments. Their influence is everywhere, from Metallica to Lady Gaga. Kiss have inspired thousands of artists of diverse genres, some of whom may be on a Hall of Fame trajectory themselves. They've been a formative influence on members of Tool, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, Slipknot, Garth Brooks, Pantera, Foo Fighters, Motley Crue, Lenny Kravitz, White Zombie, Soundgarden, Nine Inch Nails, and Rage Against the Machine to name just a few. Okay. Okay. Impact, check. Influence, check. And the final criteria? Awesomeness. There's a simple test for that. What if you had never seen or heard Kiss before? What if you had never heard a note of their music, never viewed a YouTube clip, never seen a reality show featuring any of the members? And what if you wandered into a divey club in your hometown and saw Kiss in all their glory thrashing the place to the ground? One guy belching fire and spraying blood past his gargantuan tongue, a drum riser bursting through the roof, a guitar player so incredible his axe billowed smoke and shot rockets, a frontman flying back and forth across the joint like a superhero Tarzan, all of them in frightening horror movie, comic book, superstar, sexifying kabuki makeup, all of them in black and silver warrior bondage gear and seven inch platform heels, the place blowing up and exploding, screeching and liberating rock and roll. What would you say if you saw that? You'd say, that band's fucking awesome and deserves to be in the rock and roll. <laughs> Eric Carr, Vinnie Vincent, Mark St. John, Bruce Kewitt, Eric Singer, and Tommy Thayer have all been important in extending and expanding Kiss's impressive legacy, and they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> but tonight, we honor the fearsome force, the four original founding members of Kiss, the demon Gene Simmons. He's the god of thunder. He's Dr. Love. He's Beatles like bass on the bottom and a bat lizard Bella Lugosi on the top. The star child, Paul Stanley. The heartthrob ringmaster of Kiss's Psycho Circus. His vision, talent, and dedication over four decades have made Kiss the band it is today. The spaceman, Ace Freer. first guitar hero. He designed the band's iconic logo and blazed unforgettable, timeless licks across their greatest records. And the cat, Peter Chris. <laughs> Jungle rhythms, jazz fills, and the writer and singer of the band's biggest hit, the world's first power ballad, Beth. But tonight, tonight, we also honor the fifth member of the band, without whom this night could never have happened. Tonight we are honor the KISS Army. <laughs> Generations of fiercely loyal fans who are celebrating this long overdue induction all over the planet tonight. Tonight proves beyond any shadow of a doubt that the high school bullies and the critics were mistaken. We KISS fans were right, so let's celebrate. I misspoke earlier when I said that tonight KISS enters the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That's almost right, because tonight it's not the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Tonight 
It's the rock and roll all night and party every day, Hall of Fame. And so, without further ado, Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, Ace Freely, Peter Crick, you wanted the best and you got the best. So Tom Morello's speech, for anybody that I've talked to so far, is it's dead on. It's perfect. It's it says everything that needs to be said. It's it lets everybody know that this is our band. We love them because they kick ass. And when you see them in concert, you walk out saying that kicked ass. And if you had never seen them before, you would walk out going, man, that band is awesome. And they belong in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is where they are. The Rock and Roll All Night and Party Every Day Hall of Fame, according to Tom Morello. He also mentioned the fighting and the bickering that you had with your friends when you were a kid because they liked Aerosmith or ACDC, or whatever, and you liked Kiss, and they let you know that your band sucked, and you said, kiss my Kiss loving ass. I love Kiss. When I was growing up, I didn't have posters of any other band on my wall, ever. It just didn't happen. And there was one reason why, and that was because Kiss was is and always will be the greatest rock and roll band of all time, as far as I'm concerned. You get everything with this band you want great vocals you get them from paul stanley you want show you get it from the whole band you want a killer drum solo you get it from peter chris you get you want man you ain't gonna get spitting blood and fire from anybody else that's for damn sure unless they came afterwards in which case they're just doing what gene did and ace fraley <laughs> i don't even have to say anything he's a badass so Tom Morello's speech was dead on. I, I we had a, a show. I did a show where I said who should induct Kiss in the Hall of Fame, and every name from Eddie Trunk, Scott Ian, Sebastian Bach, every name was mentioned. Nobody mentioned Tom Morello not one time, and I probably got fifty to seventy-five different you know people saying this is who who should be in. Nobody ever mentioned Tom Morello. I'm damn glad it was Tom Morello because he wrote. He wrote it from a Kiss fan, you know, view. That I mean, it was his way of of being able to step up and say, "I've been a Kiss fan all my life, and now I'm finally going to get the opportunity to to tell everybody how proud I was." And then he did it. So that was pretty awesome. Now let's talk about the introduction. I mean, the uh, the the Hall of Fame speeches by the four knuckleheads. I was really pleased by by it. If you have not heard the speeches that the guys gave, I'm going to play that right now. Let me hear you! Tom, Tom Morello, my friends. Tom Morello. We are humbled, all of us, to stand up on this stage and do what we love doing. This is a profound moment for all of us. We are humbled that the fans ever gave us the chance to do what we love doing. And so I'm here just to say a few kind words about the four knuckleheads 40 years ago who got together and decided to put together the band we never saw on stage. Critics be damned. To Ace Frehley. Yeah! Yeah! His iconic guitar playing has been imitated but never equaled by generations of guitar players around the world. To Peter Chris, who's drumming. Who's drumming and singing, well, there's not a guy out who beats the sticks who sounds just like Peter. Nobody's got that swing and that style. Something happened 40 years ago. I met the partner and the brother I never knew I had, Paul Stanley. You couldn't ask for somebody. You couldn't ask for somebody more awesome to be on the same team. I am humbled 
I was going to say a few kind words about Eric Carr, rest in peace. Mark St. John, rest in peace. Vinnie Vincent, the great Bruce Kulik. And of course, here we are 40 years later with the great Eric Singer and Tommy Thayer. We Woo! However, nothing, and I do too. We wouldn't be here today without the original Fantastic Four. God bless you all. May I introduce the powerful and attractive Peter Chris. It's very heavy. I want to say it's great to be home in Brooklyn. This is my home. I'd like to thank the Hall of Fame for this honor. Uh, I never thought this could happen in my life. Uh, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody that had something to do with my career and the band's career. In 50 years, I've been doing it. In the 40 years, we've been doing it. Uh, Jesus, from the grips to the truck drivers to the great producers to the great managers to the great people that just were all there for us for all the years of the hard times and good times. God bless you and thank you so much. There's so many names I'd be here only. I want to definitely thank our first manager, Bill Coin, who we would not be here if not for Bill, and Sean Delaney, the great uh, Joyce Bogart, and the great Neil Bogart, uh, who would cast a blank of records for I. Those were the great days, and I thank them all. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the band, of course, Mr. Stanley, Mr. Simmons, and one and only Spaceman Ace Fairley. I'd like to also congratulate the other inductees, how legendary they are. I'm a big fan of all of them. I uh, recently seen uh, Daryl Hall's show, and I fell in love with the showman, so. Uh, I'd like to also say I am now seven years male breast cancer free. Thank you. And I'm very proud of that. I have uh, organizations here, my Beauty Ball Girls and my Cancer Support Center, and my doctor, Alex Switzer, who saved my life from Presbyterian. Thank you so much. Uh, I will not be here. I'd like to thank my family, my sister Donna, Donna, who I know is out there, all my friends who have come, and God, there's so many of them I cannot be here all night again for you. I'd like to thank my lovely wife, Gigi, uh, who makes my life really, really good and a lot easier. And let me tell you, walking through life with her is a blessing. I love you, babe. I love you to death. Uh, I'm pretty much down. My idol was Gene Cooper. Uh, it's why I wanted to play drums. I got my first lesson from my best friend, Jerry Nolan, of the New York Dolls. And boy, with that, that just started it all off. Uh, I want to say that uh, in or out of makeup, I'll always be the cat man. So it, it really doesn't matter. Oh! You gotta forgive to live. It's so really important. And remember, early detection will save your life. And God bless each and every one of you. I will remember this for the rest of my life. Thank you so much. Speech here, but I didn't, these are on prescription, so I can't read. <laughs> uh, it's so great to be here with, with all these other celebrities and great musicians. You know, and uh, I want to thank Paul, Gene, and Peter. Thank you so much, Tom, for that beautiful introduction. I want to thank the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for inducting us. Thank you very much. And uh, here I am. You know, when I was 13 years old and I picked up my first guitar, I always sensed that I was going to be into something big. And little did I know, a few years later, there it was. I experienced the summer of love. <laughs> All right. That was before I met these clowns. 
And uh, several years later, we got together, and you know the story, it's all history. A few quick names, Bill O'Coin, Joyce Byrus, who used to manage us in conjunction with Bill and ended up marrying Neil Bogart. We wouldn't be here without Neil Bogart and Casablanca Records. Everyone at Casablanca Records, everyone at ATI, Jeff and Wally, people at the press office. Can I read it? Maybe I can. <laughs> Carol and Al Ross. Um, Carol Kay, just to name a few. If, if I named everybody that helped us through our career, I'd be here for another half an hour. So, uh, it's great to be here. I wanted to touch on the fact that, you know, I've been sober now seven and a half years. And we still need to educate the people in this country about sobriety because some people think that it has to do with willpower. But, you know, unfortunately, most addicts are born that way, and uh, people need to be educated about that, you know? My sponsor used to, he had, a good, he had a good saying, you know, to try to explain what it's like to be an addict, you know, when people say, use willpower, he'd say, try using willpower when you have diarrhea, you know? <laughs> so, only by the grace of God I'm here, I want to thank my first wife, Jeanette, my daughter, my current fiance, Rachel Gordon. Uh, life's been good to me. You know, hopefully I got another 10 or 20 years to go. Thank you very much. I can make this short. I can make this short and sweet because everybody said everything has been much funnier than I'll ever be. So I got to thank Tom who's championed us sh shamelessly and unapologetically. It took a lot of balls, and God bless you. Yay! For us, this is a special night, but it's really a special night for our fans. This is vindication. Woo! We couldn't have done this without you, Peter. Ace, Gene, we are the original foursome. We couldn't have done this had we not started it together. Everything we've done is built on the past. We've got a great, great legacy. We've got Bruce here, we've got Tommy, we've got Eric. Woo! When I first started listening to music, I was lucky. I saw a lot of people I loved. When I was a kid, I saw Solomon Burke, I saw Otis Redding, I got to see the Yardbirds, I got to see Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, Sly and the Family Stone, the list goes on and on. What I loved about all these musicians is that they had the spirit of rock and roll. I believe that the spirit of rock and roll means you follow your own path regardless of critics and regardless of your peers. I think we've done that for 40 years. Here we are tonight basically inducted for the same things that we were kept out from. The people, I believe, are speaking to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and what they're saying is they want more, they deserve more. They want to be a part of the induction, they want to be a part of the nomination. They don't want to be spoon-fed by a handful of people. Yeah! The people pay for tickets. The people buy albums. The people who nominate do not. Let's not forget that these are the people who make it all possible. We just So I look out here and I see all these people, I see faces that over the years inspired me, people that made me what I am. So I'm here tonight because of the people who inspired me and I'm also here because of the people I inspired. So God bless you all, it's a wonderful night. 
okay, so that was really great. Funny, um, you know, it, it, it had humor and it had a little oh moments for Peter. Let's talk about each one of them. And by let's talk about them, I mean I'm going to talk about them because I can't hear you. Anyway, <laughs> Gene said he was humbled a number of times. And I'm going to tell you right now, in my entire life of hearing Gene talk, I really felt this was the first time when he was talking, he was humbled. I really felt like this was emotional for him. He loved the fact that it was getting done. He loved what Tom had to say. He mentioned that the band went on for success. Critics be damned. He said, you know, and, and that's despite what the critics, they tried to ruin Kiss. They tried to, but the the people with Kiss Army would not let that happen. And that is really, you know, it, it, it was really important to him. He said great things about everybody in the band, including calling um, Paul his partner and brother. He mentioned Eric Carr, rest in peace. He mentioned Mark St. John, rest in peace. He mentioned everybody. That was really cool. Peter, really funny how he picked up the thing. He was like, it's very heavy, the award. I was just like, it's like something my grandpa would have said. Anyway, you know, it's just, it was silly to me. Anyway, he thanked everyone, Bill Coin, Neil Bogart. And the funny thing, the thing that stuck out to me was the Mr. Stanley, Mr. Simmons. And then he took his shot at Tommy. Now, you can tell me that it wasn't a shot at Tommy, but it was a shot at Tommy when he said, the one and only spaceman. Ace Fraley, that's a shot at Tommy. Or it could be a shot at Paul and Gene for putting somebody else in the Spaceman or Ace Fraley makeup. But that's how I took it. And then he took his shot at, you know, I'll always be the Catman in or out of makeup. And then he said something that's very was very interesting to me. He said, you've got to forgive to live. But he has, I mean, he's obviously bitter. <laughs> he said he took a shot at Tommy and Eric. I, I, I may be reading this wrong, but that's how I read it. Ace gets up there. I was really, by the way, I was really happy still with Peter's speech. Man, it's cool to hear him. You know, it, it's cool to see the four of them together. Ace Fraley. He walks up immediately as the wrong glasses. That was the most perfect thing that could have happened to him at the beginning because it was just so ace. It was just so Ace Fraley. It, he forgot he had the wrong glasses. He can't read his speech. And then halfway through, he's like, maybe I can read this. It's like all of a sudden, my eyes work. It was really funny. Anyway. Okay, so what did Ace said? Oh, he's like, you know, he called the guys clowns. And it was very loving the way he did it. I really felt like, you know, he was – when he was on that – no matter what was said before, once he was on that stage with the with the three other guys, you know, it's just like, you know – I love these guys. You know, man, we've been through so much together. That's the way it felt. <clears throat> he reminded me of a bumbling uncle. <laughs> you know, I don't have my glasses. It's just so funny. Um, Ace sober, seven and a half years. And then, of course, the diarrhea line is amazing. He also, if you catch it, he mentioned he thanked his first wife, Jeanette. Which to me was weird because Peter didn't get up there and thank Lydia. He, but you know, Ace thanked Jeanette, and of course, you know, he has to sit back and go, "I got a daughter from from Jeanette, and she was there at the beginning." It was really cool that he did that. Paul, he talked about the fans getting vindication. And that everything that came afterwards was built on the past, on what Paul, Ace, Gene, and Peter did. When he mentioned Bruce's name, people were chanting Bruce. And you could hear people on the recording asking, are they saying, is he saying Bruce? It was like, uh, at first I thought maybe they were booing Tommy, but I don't think that was what it was. I think they were saying Bruce like that. I think... Paul's uh, speech was very political. It was a message to the Hall of Fame um, because he was basically telling them, you have no idea what you're doing. You're just picking people because you think that they're cool in your little cliques. But really, you know, in your clique, we're not cool. But, you know, there's thousands and millions of people that have come to see us in concert. So obviously we're cool. 
you have no idea, obviously, what, you know, they have no idea what they're doing. There are so many bands that are awesome that aren't in the Hall of Fame. He said, he talked about people that inspired him and the fact that he, you know, inspired people, and all of it is true. Paul Stanley, um, you know, when I see him in concert, good or bad, he moves me. I enjoy it. I walk away every time. And some, you know, lately I might have walked away going, man, he really, you know, he's really losing his voice a little bit, but he's getting old. But you know what? You give him a good voice and, and his live show still kicks ass. You take away his live, his, his voice, which it's still, it's, you know, like I've said before, it's not perfect, but it's still better than a lot of crap I hear. Which brings me to Paul Stanley's book. <clears throat> I did not read the book. I bought the audio version because I thought it would be awesome to have Paul Stanley tell me his story. And I'm going to tell you what. It was. Reading books is a lot of fun and it's really cool. But it, I have discovered today and this past week from listening to Paul Stanley read his book to me. <laughs> Yeah, I know he wasn't reading it to me, but he was reading it to me. That it's way more fun hearing it right out of the mouth of the guy that experienced it. I'm not going to give you details of the book because I don't want to ruin it. The only things that I'm going to talk about are, A, his life was just like mine. He had ups and downs. He felt quirky. He had problems. People picked on him. Every one of us, or most of us anyway, go through that. Paul, it was refreshing and sad at the same time to hear Paul talking about his personal life before Kiss. And even after he became famous and rich, he still struggled to find himself i guess is you know the be the best way to put it it was amazing to hear about how he talked about his sister and his niece and i'll tell you that i remember and i have it upstairs the 16 magazine where it was like facts about paul stanley and it mentioned that he takes care of his sister's daughter and i always used to I, I thought about that the first time I read it, and I was a kid, and it really didn't uh, like occur to me that there might have been a problem with his sister. But when you read the book, you find out why, and make sure you read the book. I would tell you, go on iTunes and download it because it's way more fun. Now, remember this. Now, this is important. If you download it on an iPad, you can't. it doesn't go into the cloud, so you can't get it on your phone. So download it to the device that you're going to listen to it. So you're going to listen to it on your phone, download it into your phone, and listen to it on your phone. Put it on, you know, into your car when you're driving. It's about 10 hours, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly. I think it's – it might be a little more, but I, I think it's a, between 10 and 12 hours of listening. So it's – you know, Paul reading the whole book, <clears throat> he talked about Bill and Coin and how they met, and a lot of that story was the same, but he gets into some really messed up things about Bill and Coin. And once again, I'm not going to tell you. I'm just going to say read it because you're going to go, no way that that happened. Because when, Paul, when it happened, Paul went, no way that that happened. The band was robbed a number of times. The people who were running their finances, were sticking it to them left and right. When it came to the merchandising, the number that they threw out that they made was not nearly as much as I thought it would be. And then you figure out why as the book goes on. He made his peace with Bill Coin. That was really amazing. The But before he died, I will say that to me, the most shocking thing out of the entire book was finding out the situation with Eric Carr and at his funeral, Eric Carr, according to Paul's book, let me make sure that's clear. According to Paul's book, I wasn't there. I'm going by what he said. Eric had a lot of problems. You know, he was always upset about not, he had a, not being the original drummer from kiss and Paul, according to Paul was always trying to smooth that over. You know, Paul 
talks about going to Eric's funeral and the people were looking at him, you know, in the kind of, I guess, disgusted in him, you know, it all came down to the revenge album and the fact that Eric wasn't playing on it. And Paul, what he figured out or what he came to think um, was the reason is really amazing. And if it's true, it's sad. And at the same time, Paul kind of, I don't know, he doesn't blame himself for Eric's death. That's, that's not what happens, but he definitely talks about – he feels bad about a decision that they made. Once again, read the book. I promise all this will come together, and it will make sense. But there are thing, there are a lot of things in here that you're going to go, oh, I knew all, all about this. He does not pull any punches talking about Gene. That was what I was really waiting to see. Is he going to be like, Gene is awesome, Gene is great, Gene is awesome, Gene is great? No, he was not. He made sure that he let you know the truth, according to Paul Stanley. That's what this book is. It's the truth according to Paul Stanley, and I'll tell you that I believe, you know, I believe it so far. I mean, I, I haven't had anybody, you know, sh show me an article where they're going, Paul Stanley, you know lied or this isn't true i will tell you that eric carr's girlfriend when he died carrie <clears throat> did send out a tweet that ripped paul for being a liar and he should be ashamed of himself when saying it said in the tweet that eric carr never did drugs that's what she said eric carr never did drugs and he should be ashamed of himself and blah 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 but in the book i want to make sure you know that Paul never said Eric did drugs. At least my understanding was he said, I think Eric was on drugs, but I can't prove it. It just seemed that way. But he never said Eric did drugs. So, that you know, I think she was getting a little, you know, and, and, and I don't know if she read it um, or if somebody said, hey, did you see this? Paul Stanley said Eric did drugs. And then she got pissed off and did the Twitter thing. I don't, I don't know that story. You know, all I know is, is, as I was on Twitter, I saw her tweet, and then like 10 minutes later, ironically, it came up when I was listening to Paul tell the story. He explains the the he explains everything. It is the kiss it is Paul Stanley's life in history in Paul's eyes and in Paul's words, and I really loved it, and this is what I got from it. Let me tell you. It's a story about a guy that his whole life, he had no idea who he was, what was happening, the struggle of life. It's in his – he struggled. He struggled. He struggled. It was a struggle his whole life. It was – you know, even when he thought people loved him, he felt like people didn't love him. And even when he thought – you know, his feelings were getting hurt constantly by people that he thought cared about him, and then they would say things, and he would have to step back and go, God, you know, I put my guard down with you because I thought you were my friend, and I thought you loved me, and now you say this to me, and I'm going to step back. And, you know, it, everything came together with Evan. That's the way – Evan came, Paul Stanley's son, and his life changed drastically. His other kids have come. His life has changed drastically. I get now from reading the book that Paul Stanley, at his age right now, is happy. He has found his place. He has figured out who he is, and and it's a really good it's a really good book. I enjoyed it. It made me feel pretty good about myself. It made me go, look, Paul Stanley's so lucky to have you know record deals and fans and women his whole life, but he wasn't happy. He was sort of happy, I guess, but he wasn't completely happy. It took, you know, it took everything at, you know, culminating all the way to the end before he was extremely thrilled. The, if, what fixed for him, you know, it, what fixed his life for him was the end. The, you know, the second wife, the family, Evan, with the first wife, Pam. He was really blindsided by a lot of people, and once again, Gene is one of them. Um, Bill Coin is one of them. Eric Carr is one of them. Vinny Vincent is absolutely one of them. What I got was, you know, he talks about Peter. He talked, man. There's a story in there about Peter's 
dick. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I don't normally say anything even remotely foul, but there's a story about Peter's dick and Ace's shoulder, and when you get to that, prepare yourself. <laughs> I mean, I told somebody, Nickelback Rick, who used to be on the show with me, when I told him that story, he was like, oh, really? I was like, yeah, really. <clears throat> he explained why Tommy's in the band and how many different times Tommy almost had to play because Ace wasn't showing up for gigs. He explained a lot of stories about Peter Chris, and it pretty much, so, you know, solidifies what I always thought was probably the problem with Peter Chris. According to Paul, I want to keep saying that because I don't want you guys to think that I'm diving in head first. And, you know, I, I don't know if all of this is true. It felt true. It felt real. Just like when I read Ace's book and he was telling the stories and I was going, God bless. He wouldn't have lied about that. Anyway, that's my show. I want you guys to know that I really appreciate everything that you've been uh, writing me and stuff. I know I said that before. Please go on the iTunes page and leave a review for me. It, it, will, it will be mucho appreciated. It'll take you one minute. Write a little blurb. Put the stars. Thank you very much. Um, next week, I'm going to have Jody Have Not on. And I'm not sure what we're going to talk about, but it'll be good because Jody Havnot is the man. Thank you guys for listening. We will see you next time. Peace.